Good morning, church. One of the most <clears throat> celebrated artists of all time is Vincent van Gogh. He's on a particularly hot popularity streak right now, despite having died 132 years ago. Earlier this year, my wife Blythe and I went to the Immersive Van Gogh exhibit, which took a large room in downtown Detroit, projected a short film uh, featuring his art in all directions, filling the entire room. And it was actually one of two competing national tours, the other of which came to Detroit last year. And the popularity has inspired them to do uh, the same with other artists as well. But if you want to see Vincent's art firsthand, you are in luck, at least until the end of January, because the Detroit Institute of Arts currently has an exhibit featuring 74 authentic Van Gogh paintings from collections gathered from around the world. Now, I haven't been yet, but Blythe went with some of her fellow art students, and they highly recommend it. The DIA isn't doing this just because Vincent Van Gogh is suddenly popular again, but to celebrate the 100th anniversary of their first purchase of a Van Gogh work of art, which was this painting up here, his self-portrait from 1887. And that was the first time a public museum in America had ever purchased his art for display. And that was in 1922. Vincent van Gogh died from suicide in 1890, but it took that long for him to be recognized as a world-class painter. In his life, <clears throat> Vincent wasn't what we would call successful. Many people saw his works for sale. They're now worth millions of dollars, and they passed on them. He would trade paintings for food or art supplies. Only one of his paintings is recorded to have been sold during his lifetime for the equivalent of about $2,000. And it was purchased by one of his friend's sisters that felt bad for him. His brother Theo really wanted to see his brother recognized in the way that he deserved, but he died just six months after Vincent. And so Theo's wife, Jo, was left with hundreds of her brother-in-law's paintings and the mission to get the world to finally notice them. And over the next 35 years of her life, that's exactly what she did. She was able to get the world to see these paintings and to finally appreciate their greatness and the greatness of their painter. And so, to, and so today, Vincent would be shocked and amazed if he found out just how beloved he is today. And if you want to talk more about Van Gogh and really any other artist, please talk to my wife. She's, she would love to talk your ear off. And if you didn't get that joke, she will happily explain it to you. <laughs> as much as the world loves to celebrate people that they deem worthy of greatness, the world isn't actually all that great at recognizing greatness. This is a story that we see over and over again throughout history, whether it's people who, who struggled and, and eventually found fame and appreciation after being repeatedly ignored or rejected, or if it's people like Vincent who never found it in their own lifetimes. We see this over and over again, and it's one that we see in the stories of the Bible as well. We're going through a long series of lessons called The Story. We're about a third of the way through it, which is guiding us through Genesis to Revelation, helping us to see the overarching narrative of the Bible. And we've already seen many times how God has continually used underdogs and people who didn't, the world didn't expect much out of it all, who weren't all that qualified, but whom God called and used anyway. And while the world isn't great at recognizing greatness and potential. God is. Today's story 
is about a kid named David. This is the story of a shepherd. We're going to be in the book of 1 Samuel today. We were looking at, uh, last week we talked about Samuel, who was the spiritual leader of Israel. But the people wanted a king instead, like all the other nations around them. And Samuel warned them that this was a very bad idea. And that they already had a king, God. But Israel refused to listen, and so they were given their very first king, a man named Saul. He was tall and strong, a mighty warrior just like they wanted. But he wasn't a good man, and he increasingly proved himself to be the kind of king that Samuel warned the people about. Saul did not love and obey God. And as such, he was a terrible representative of God because Israel's king was cruel and greedy. The other nations around them assumed that Israel's God was cruel and greedy too and not loving, compassionate, and gracious. It got to the point that in in 1 Samuel 15, we read something very rare in the Bible. God expressed regret. In fact, the only other time this is said was in in Genesis, before the flood, when God regretted making human beings. But there in 1 Samuel 15, 10, we read, And the word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry, and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Now, unlike in Genesis, God didn't wipe out the kingdom with a flood this time, but God did know that it was time to start over with a new king. And in 1 Samuel 16, right after this, the Lord sent Samuel to the house of a man named Jesse in a small town called Bethlehem because one of his sons had been chosen to be the new king. And to connect the story from two weeks ago, Jesse happened to be the grandson of Ruth the Moabite. And I probably don't need to mention how that little town of Bethlehem connects to a story that will come much later, but we'll get to that. Heading to Bethlehem, Samuel filled a horn with oil to anoint the new king, and he set off on what seemed like a very simple mission. He went in secret, knowing that Saul wouldn't like this very much. Not even Jesse would know what Samuel was really doing there. And at Jesse's house, Samuel had all of Jesse's sons line up, and one of these had to be the new king, but which one? It wasn't who Samuel expected. Looking at verse 6 of 1 Samuel 16, this is what we read. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands before the, here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his heights, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are are these all the sons that you have? Well... Oh, they're still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. And so he sent for him and had him brought in. And he was glowing with health and had a fine appearance, handsome features. And then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. 
And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. I don't think there's anyone that could have predicted what was going to happen in this story. Not Samuel, not Jesse, and not the seven brothers, and definitely not David himself. He was the runt, the youngest son, probably only around 16 years old. Like Cinderella, he wasn't even considered at first until the Lord told Samuel to keep looking. He was off tending the sheep, which wasn't a glamorous job. But he was just appointed to fill the role of king of Israel. This, is, this story is such a humble introduction to one of the most important people in the Bible who is talked about and referenced about as much as Moses. Did you know this, notice in the story that he isn't even named until the end? Maybe it's because everyone who was reading or being told this story already knew that this is about King David. Or maybe it's because a humble introduction is fitting for someone who would be so characterized by their humility. Why David? He didn't look like a king. David wasn't tall and strong like Saul. Apparently his brother Eliab fit that qualification, but God told Samuel that that's not what was being considered at all. God wasn't considering the new king's outward appearance, but his heart. Israel needed a king that would be humble and obedient, showing strength in gentleness and in mercy. They would need a king who would tend to them like, like a shepherd. And those are not typically qualities that the world considers in greatness, especially among their leaders, but God knows what's really important. You may know that David wrote a whole lot of psalms too. Not all of them though, and David would would have been too humble to write Psalm 78, which ends by telling us in verse 70, the Lord chose David his servant and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people Jacob, and of Israel, his inheritance. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. David would go from shepherd to king, but he would always be a shepherd. Now, being anointed is far from being coronated, though, and and there would be several years would pass before David would wear the crown that was still currently on Saul's head. And Saul would not take very kindly to being usurped and replaced either. But for now, he had no idea. He actually really liked David at first. David was a musician and and played the lyre, which got him a place in Saul's court, soothing the king when needed. And then David took care of a little problem named Goliath. You're probably familiar with that story. After slaying that giant of an enemy, you'd think that it'd be like King Arthur drawing the sword from the stone and that David would be crowned king right then and there with a big parade around him. But it would be another 14 years during which he was mostly on the run from his life from King Saul, who grew increasingly more paranoid and jealous and angry with David. The rest of 1 Samuel narrates this time period, which has story after story of David proving his character and showing the people of Israel what God had seen in his heart. This was a man who loved God and wanted God's people to love God too. David was a man after God's own heart. Is that all it takes? I mean, surely there have to be more qualifications to being a king than that, right? I mean, it's true, there are. 
But with the story of David, we see a truth that is revealed many times in the Bible. God is able to turn shepherds into kings and fishermen into apostles. As it's often said, God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies the called. God provides all of the power and the strength needed to do God's will. We just need hearts that are ready, which are humble and obedient and able to serve and sacrifice. There is a lot that God can do and accomplish through good hearts. Now, David wasn't perfect by any means. And next week, we'll look at the story of a scandal, how he did something truly awful. But the way that he repented and sought forgiveness was still true to the humbleness of his heart. And in so many ways, he was the antithesis of King Saul, the opposite of all Saul's characteristics. And like I said last week, we saw that one of the reasons Saul was so bad was that he was so different from the real king of Israel, God. Saul was a terrible representative to the surrounding nations of who God is and what God was like. David, though he was still a sinner, was much better at demonstrating to God's people and to the people around them the love and care shown to them by the Lord who is our shepherd. You may be familiar with the most famous of David's psalms where he described God as such. The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not be in want. In living this way, God, <clears throat> David foreshadowed and pointed to another anointed one that would come long after him, another shepherd king that would do what David did but perfectly and without sin. Do you know what anointed one is in Aramaic? Messiah. In Greek, it's the word Christ. Today is the first day of the season of Advent, and it won't be long before it's Christmas. And we'll be remembering how Jesus was born in Bethlehem, that city of David, in the humblest of circumstances. If David didn't seem like king material, Jesus definitely didn't either. Throughout his life, the world struggled to recognize the greatness in Jesus, the godness in Jesus. They could not see what God sees. They couldn't see his heart. But as Jesus walked this earth among its people, he did so with God's eyes, seeing beyond people's outward appearances and looking in to their hearts. He spent his time with the most unlikely of men and women whom the world looked down at as weak. But Jesus saw something much more than that. They weren't poor peasants. They weren't beggars. They were royalty, beloved children of God the King. And so Jesus called them to serve in God's kingdom because he knew what God could do through them, not with their own abilities or with their own skills, but through the strength and power and spiritual gifts which God would provide. And today there are still so many people in this world who see themselves as undeserving and unqualified. They think they're failures, but they're not. They may have failed. They may have made mistakes, but they are not failures. They are humans. And maybe that's you. 
But people who have failed know something important, that it's not about them. It can't be. They need something more. They need a strength that is not their own. And to those who possess hearts that are willing to obey and to do God's will, they will find it. They will hear the voice of the Good Shepherd calling out their names. Do you hear it? In John chapter 10, Jesus tells us, I am the Good Shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. The voice of the Good Shepherd is calling your name. He knows you and calls you to come. Know Him and know His love. Like his ancestor David, Jesus isn't just a shepherd, He's a king. He's not impressed with the things that the world is impressed by. He knows real greatness when he sees it, and Jesus sees it in you. He sees the good that is within you, the image of God that you were created in, because he was there. All things were created through him and for him, and that includes you. Jesus sees your potential and is able to draw it out into its fullness. He can accomplish great and marvelous things through you. Yes, even miracles. The world may not see it in you, and maybe you don't see it in yourself. But the God who created you, who cares for you, who loves you, sees it plain as day. Do you see what God sees in you. For you are a beautiful artwork to God, worth more than any painting in this world. And that is the gospel we are preaching and the good news we are proclaiming, not just with our words, but with our lives. May the world see it, and may they know it. May we as God's people help our neighbors to see this beautiful truth about themselves, especially those who are having such a hard time seeing it, as the world tries to cover it up and obscure the beauty that is within them. Let us love the world with the love that God has for each and every one of them. And may they know that to God, they are worthy and worth it. And if you are in need of this good news today, we would love to share more with you about our shepherd. And if you want to be baptized into Christ and to Join his beautiful, eternal kingdom. We would love to see it happen today. And if you are struggling, if you are in need of encouragement, if you are in need of prayer, if you need help seeing yourself as God sees you, know that you are not alone. God has given you a community. And if God can minister to you through us. Let us know. You can find me, one of our shepherds, our elders, one of our Stephen ministers, and we will pray for you right now. But in all things, may God and God alone receive all glory and honor and praise. Amen.